Uh, we're going to just talk a little bit about who the Cambridge Housing Authority is, uh, for those of you who don't know. Um, give a brief history of uh, Jefferson Park Federal um, and that development and that site. Uh, we're going to go over the project timeline for the proposed uh, redevelopment and modernization. Um, we're going to take a look at the neighborhood, the street and site context, uh, and we're going to um, uh, hear from our architecture team um, and look at uh, the design goals for the project uh, and look at uh, a proposed site plan. And at the end, as I mentioned, we're going to go over um, questions and comments. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our executive director, um, Michael Johnston. Hi, good evening, folks. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. A um, little bit about the Housing Authority for those that don't know. Um, we were established in 1935. Um, and we serve um, about 8,000 um, households uh, in total, um, about 14,000 individuals. Um, we have about 200 employees um, and we have an annual budget of um, a little over $170 million. Um, our mission, which we believe in, um, is to develop and manage safe, uh, good quality affordable housing for low income individuals and families in a manner that promotes citizenship, community, self-reliance in one of the most expensive housing markets in the country. Um, I, I, we're, we were actually rated, I believe, this year by the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Um, I, I think we're at number three in the country right now for most expensive housing markets in the United States. Um, and just uh, this is the team for the revitalization of JP. Um, and the team here has over 100 years of uh, um, collective experience working in Cambridge. Um, I've been here for, uh, it'll be 30 years in June. Um, I, I can tell you that, uh, you know, we're dedicated to the mission. We're dedicated to what we do. Um, we believe in what we do. Um, and, you know, we've been, you know, we, we've all worked our way up um, from, uh, you know, placing people in these units to now creating new affordable units um, throughout the city for our residents coming off the list. Okay, thank you, Mike. So as, as Mike introduced, um, you know, the 8,000 households that we serve um, in Cambridge and beyond, um, the CHA provides long-term rental housing and rental assistance uh, to over 5,500 households uh, in, in Cambridge itself. Um, there, as he also touched on, Cambridge has a great need for affordable housing. Um, we have over 18,500 distinct applicants on our wait list. Um, those are you know, individual applicants that are in need of housing. Um, through our modernization efforts, we've been able to make an extraordinary reduction in the amount of energy used at our sites. Um, you know, a reduction, a 25% reduction in greenhouse gas over five years. Um, 450 kilowatt hours of energy generated on site uh, at our developments. Um, so, you know, sustainability um, and resiliency are you know, something that the CHA has has been working on for a while and something that we we feel is very important. Uh, CHA provides more than just housing. Uh, we have a robust resident services program and the CHA partners with over 20 organizations and provides in-house services uh, to reach 4,500 residents. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. A resident services program, uh, one of the programs that they run is called the Workforce. Um, that is operated right out of Jefferson Park State, uh, just adjacent to Jefferson Park Federal, uh, where they work uh, with um, young adults, high school seniors, or high, high schoolers, um, and they do uh, mentoring, job training. Um, some of the other programs also do vocational training, self-sufficiency programs for adults, um, 
for um, residents and voucher holders. Um, so there's a, a lot of a lot of work that we do outside of just housing. The CHA has years of experience managing large construction projects. You've probably seen our work around town. Uh, these are our ongoing projects uh, from left to right. Uh, Truman Apartments in Millers River in East Cambridge, um, Porter Road and Burns Apartments in North Cambridge. Porter Road is right uh, in Porter Square and Burns Apartments is just off of Mass Ave in North Cambridge. In the past 10 years, we've completed over $585 million in capital improvements. Um, our construction emphasizes long-term durability, livability, energy efficiency, and with a focus on high quality construction. So we also have a long history in North Cambridge. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So next door, Jefferson Park State. Uh, this is a photo of it uh, completed after its redevelopment, uh, finished in 2018. Um, originally, it was this, the buildings on this site were constructed in 1949 as veterans housing. Um, it was torn down in 2016 because of uh, systemic problems with mold, moisture, poor air quality. Um, the, the type of construction uh, wasn't um, it wasn't feasible um, given the masonry and, and concrete construction to really reconfigure it. Um, so it was redeveloped um, into this design you see today. The design's a great example of breaking up the facade with changes in massing and glazing um, as will be required by the affordable housing overlay. So Jefferson Park State is an award-winning multifamily design with an abundance of private and public outdoor spaces and with a lush landscaping. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our design team. Um, again, we have uh, partnered with BWA Architecture. Um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Steve Baker and Michelle Auer. Um, Steve, are you? Yep, I'm here. <laughs> Uh, uh, Steve is going to introduce um, Lincoln Way Apartments. Uh, that was another CHA BWA partnership that was uh, very successful, and we're hoping to build on that success. Go ahead, Steve. Sure. Good evening, everybody. I'm Steve Baker, a senior principal, founding principal of BWA Architecture. Uh, BWA is a 20 person firm located in downtown Boston, and uh, we've had a 25 year partnership with CHA. Um, I can't even count the number of projects we've done with CHA over the years, but it's more than 50 of various sizes. And one we wanted to show, because this is one you can go by and see, Lincoln Way uh, is a new neighborhood, or not, not so new now, it's been there a few years, of 70 homes um, in the North Cambridge neighborhood. This is off Walden Street. The photo you there, first photo was Walden. It's located right near Sherman Street, across from Ray Raymond Park. If you know where that is, you can go by. So these are some photos. It's uh, three-story construction, and it's a combination of townhouses and some duplex apartments over flat apartments. Um, we think it's very successful. It's held up well, and it's really worked well for the authority. Um, so we uh, obviously would be looking to do something a little bit different at um, Jefferson Park, but I think you'll see that it would share a lot of the similar features that you would see at Lincoln Way. Thanks, Joe. Right, thank you, Steve. I'd just like to take one moment to uh, introduce uh, Adrian Klein um, from Mayor Siddiqui's office. Thanks for joining us, Adrian. So CHA has been providing affordable housing at Jefferson Park for over 70 years. Um, this photo on the left is from 1951 when residents first moved in. Um, it originally housed 200 families. And then a modernization in 1984 reconfigured the site and reduced it to 175 units. So today there's 175 units. Um, there's a mixture of, of larger uh, three 
and four bedroom units for families, two, three, and four bedroom units, and one bedroom apartments for single adults. Um, the site itself consists of seven three and a half story walk up buildings and one six story elevator building. Uh, the entire site is off of Ringe Ave. Um, there's one entrance um, and it's centered around a, a cul de sac, um, but effectively, you know, the whole site is kind of one way, one way in, one way out, uh, creating kind of a dead end. Um, there's a central management building uh, and community building. Uh, and then along Ringe, there are two commercial buildings. So the, you know, the years have taken its toll. Uh, comprehensive modernization in 1984 reconfigured the three story buildings, moving several bedrooms to a uh, basement or garden levels, and adding this living space uh, in an air. In, a building that wasn't properly waterproofed and didn't have proper ventilation um, led to increasing problems with sewer backups, excess moisture, mold. Um, and because of the quickly deteriorating conditions in these apartments, the CHA relocated all 57 families that were living in these apartments in 2018 and 2019, taking all the basement living spaces offline. So these 57 units have effectively been abandoned until further Funding is available to remedy these conditions. Um, in addition to problems with the basements, all eight buildings suffer from failing underground utilities, building utilities, building envelope systems, and poor ventilation. So this is the schedule for the uh, proposed modernization. Um, so uh, we have three neighborhood meetings scheduled. Um, First one obviously is tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, the next one is planned for March 25th. And uh, we're hoping to have a third one in April. Um, that date is still to be determined. Um, we are gonna be starting our resident relocation uh, in March. Um, we're hoping to have a contractor hired in April. Um, and we are looking to do this project under the new affordable housing overlay. Um, and so we were starting that process and we anticipate it, anticipate it going um, from now through September and hoping to have construction start in April of 2022. Um, you know, this development has a lot of ongoing issues. As I mentioned, these units have been vacant for, year, for a couple of years. Um, and there have been a lot of other issues uh, with the buildings. So this is something that's been on our radar for a while. And we're having this meeting now because the project uh, has uh, a funding path that's been established. And you know the affordable housing overlay that was recently passed um, uh, kind of hopefully allows us to kind of move forward with this project in the timeline that um, the state is set forth for the funding. So I'm gonna zoom out now and look at the neighborhood context. Um, so here we are in North Cambridge uh, off of Ringe Avenue. Uh, here's the site. Uh, it's an ideal site for housing. We have lots of great amenities uh, and opportunities nearby. So just looking at the surrounding development patterns, um, you have a dense residential uh, neighborhood to the east. Um, it's uh, mostly set up of regular blocks. Um, it's uh, one, two, and three family homes, um, one, two, and three stories. Uh, and then to the west, uh, you have medium to large scale developments. Um, you have the Fresh Pond Mall, um, and you have you know larger commercial buildings, office parks, uh, and large scale, medium large scale residential buildings. And then immediately south of the site, um, across the commuter line railroad tracks, uh, you have a uh, large, beautiful Danahy Park. And then just looking at some of the images of those surrounding developments. Um, 
starting at the top, uh, it's a view of uh, Russell Fields just north of the site, um, a view of some of the residential housing uh, to the east, a uh, picture of Danahee Park. Um, at the bottom there is um, the Fresh Pond Mall. And then to the left are some of the developments um, in the kind of Fresh Pond Alewife area. So looking at uh, transit, um, so the, the first circle is a quarter mile radius of the site and the outer circle is a half mile radius of the site. Um, so there's a lot of, of great opportunity for uh, walking, um, you know, transportation access by walking, uh, but by car, um, you can take Fringe Avenue into Cambridge. Um, you can take uh, Alewife Brook Parkway north to Route 2 or Route 16 or uh, south um, into Cambridge or Boston. You know, one of the greatest assets of this site is um, the access to public transportation. Um, as you can see, uh, it's just a quarter mile from the Russell Field entrance to the Red Line Alewife MBTA station. Um, that gives uh, our residents uh, incredible access to you know, not only Cambridge, but all of Boston. Um, and we also have great bus lines running right by the site. There are lots of amenities within walking distance of this site. Um, uh, there are uh, private schools, public schools, uh, charter schools, um, a lot of daycare facilities, um, uh, two shopping or uh, two grocery stores, um, some smaller uh, neighborhood stores, um, a lot of recreational opportunities with Danahee Park and Russell Field, uh, movie theaters, restaurants, shopping, uh, there's even a hotel. Um, so it's a, it's a really great location uh, for, uh, for residents. Uh, there's a lot of parks and green space. Um, adjacent to the site um, is the North Cambridge uh, Catholic Cemetery, which provides uh, uh, a lovely uh, open green area. There's Russell Field and Danahee Park, um, and then the whole Fresh Pond complex to the south of the site. So we've identified seven direct abutters to the Jefferson Park site. Um, so now we're just zooming in a little bit more to uh, the kind of pedestrian or street scale. Uh, the first, of course, is Jefferson Park State. Um, we mentioned earlier, uh, this is a view from Ringe Avenue. So Jefferson Park uh, along Ringe is three stories, stepping up to four stories. Um, this is a look at the, um, we, we call it a commercial space, but they're really community spaces. Um, this is uh, the CHA's workforce um, space here. And there's also further down um, the city's adult education program and uh, WIC um, right along Ringe. Uh, immediately to the west of the site are the Brickworks condominiums, uh, private condos and apartments. So this is a view of the Brickworks condos and just going back, they just have a, a small entrance here uh, along Ringe um, and then opens up to the larger four-story buildings. Um, this is looking at the back of our site, just noting the 10 foot elevation change uh, between the back of our site uh, and the Brickworks building. Um, so the four story buildings here are, are actually much taller than our buildings and that's you know, something that we want to really respect um, and take into consideration as we um, progress the design. So then to the south, we have the commuter line. Um, you know, this up until now, this has just been a barrier. 
um, and uh, been a source of uh, you know some problem for our, our management with uh, um, folks trespassing and that sort of thing. Um, but hopefully, uh, it, there's a proposal for a future multi-use path. Um, so for walking, cycling, um, and uh, you know, hopefully this is something that that moves forward, and we're planning uh, to connect to this amenity. Uh, down at the very corner of our site um, is the NOCA glass school, uh, as well as some, some condominiums. Uh, and then to the immediate uh, east of the site is the North Cambridge Catholic Cemetery. To north of the site, uh, of course, we have Ringe Avenue. Uh, these are some views um, along Ringe Avenue, looking west towards Alewife. Uh, the image on the top left, um, so our site starts right at that um, brick building uh, to the left. As you can see, the abutters along Ringe, there's a, there's a mix of you know, three-story, one-and-a-half-story, two-story buildings. And then Ringe Ave, looking east, um, looking away from Alewife, you have Jefferson Park State here, uh, top left, um, the gray buildings on the right, and then kind of progressing down the street um, until we are at the image at the bottom um, with the site kind of starting there right at that, that red building. So the, you know, we kind of were thinking of Ringe as a kind of a separate abutter, but then of course we have the individual units um, across the street um, at the beginning of this, you know, dense residential uh, neighborhood. Um, so these are the, the four apartments that directly abut the Jefferson Park Federal site. As you can see, they're a mixture of uh, one and a half, two and three story buildings. So, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Michelle um, from BWA Architecture. She's going to take us through um, the design goals and um, some of the preliminary design work that we've been doing. Thanks, Joe. So I'm going to start by overviewing the major design goals for JP Federal. These are really the principles that we've been using to guide our work um, in the design process. So first and foremost, obviously, uh, increase the number of affordable apartments available to um, Cambridge residents with a view towards that 18,000 long list of um, waitlist applicants. Second of all, we're really trying to integrate JP into the surrounding community and unite the federal and state developments into a cohesive neighborhood. Uh, we have a goal of improving site security, especially at the site boundaries. We'll talk a little more about this later. Um, we're trying to maximize living areas within buildings and very massing facade treatments, unit types, and the types of open spaces we provide. Lastly, we're trying to increase the site resiliency and sustainability of the buildings we provide on the site. So this is a diagram of the existing site. Um, you can see the red area is really just um, a single road and that kind of dead ends with a cul-de-sac in the middle of it. Uh, what we're trying to do with the proposed design is kind of mimic the character and the scale of the existing city blocks in the neighborhood surrounding that. So um, the new design has a scale that's much more um, representative of the surrounding neighborhood. Michelle, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you just speak up a little bit? Your microphone's a little bit soft. Sure. Is that Thank better? you so much. It's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is a site plan of the preliminary design. And this has been rotated from the views we've been looking at before. So it's sort of 90 degrees flipped to the right. Um, Ringe Avenue is on the right. The commuter rail and the proposed multi-use path 
are on the left of the site. Um, you can see we're proposing eight residential buildings um, plus that are sort of four stories and we have one maintenance building in the corner that's just a one story building. This kind of yellow color here represents the management offices and the community space that's available for resident use. And on the right hand side of building one along Ridge Avenue is a new Head Start space so accommodating um, early childhood education um, on that facade. Um, this so what we're trying to do is again to create a street street grid that responds to the scale of the existing neighborhood street grid and connects to it where where possible um, instead of having those one uh, dead ends and cul-de-sacs that really don't um, that are sort of not connected to the neighborhood. Um, the buildings were configured to create open spaces of various characters and sizes and various levels of privacy. Um, another feature of the design, which you can kind of see on this diagram, there are many little black arrows along the edges of these buildings. Those represent front doors. So those are each individual entries to individual apartments. So it's very much intentional to create this kind of many front doors, provide a, a, a real neighborhood feel. Um, and in addition, um, to kind of create the sense of like eyes on the street and improve security, especially at the perimeter of the site. And compared to um, the current design, um, we have increased the number of apartments that the site contains, but at the same time, we've managed to really um, kind of improve the amount and quality of green space available. Um, so that is a real goal is, is to provide open spaces that are really high quality that that are an amenity for the for the entire development. Um, we so part of that is minimizing paving, um, increasing the amount of vegetation available, and really trying to um, prevent, for example, the heat island effect from having a lot of asphalt around. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a sort of um, a three dimensional view of the site, sort of an aerial view. Um, again, I think it, it kind of clearly shows the kind of city block concept with a really well defined central avenue that creates a nice, um, a nicely defined public realm. You can see, uh, start to see the different open spaces that we've provided, a couple of very like pretty well enclosed semi semi private courtyards, a few courtyards that are a little bit more open, and then two larger public spaces that are really meant to be kind of an amenity like a site wide amenity. Um, so again, in this view, it's just taken from the other direction, but um, it just starts to illustrate uh, a little bit, you can kind of see the faint lines on the buildings are indicating um, individual apartment blocks. So you can see we're trying to provide um, many individual sort of townhouse units on the street. So you'll have um, as many people as possible really having their own front door and their own sense of uh, entry in place. Um, and at the same time, um, giving an opportunity to provide um, security at the at the perimeters of the site, especially. Um, we're also you're starting, you're also starting to see here a, a little bit of the opportunity that we have to kind of sculpt these forms, um, create setbacks at, at upper floors and um, just kind of push and pull the massing to kind of create more variability um, and, uh, you know, respect the scale of the neighborhood. Um, so I think you can also just uh, um, kind of understand the connection a little bit to JP in terms of scale and just form of buildings. So going ahead, we start to look at the, um, this is a table of the dimensional requirements for um, the affordable housing overlay uh, zoning ordinance. So this is a new 
ordinance that Joe mentioned was passed just this fall. Um, you can see that we are um, meeting or within the required limits for, for all of the dimensional um, thresholds. So site setbacks are, we comply with all of the site, uh, excuse me, setbacks. And um, we're be well below the FAR ratio for the site. Um, uh, excuse me, Michelle, can you just explain what FAR is? Oh, sure, yes. FAR is, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a, a measurement of um, how densely a site can be built up. So it's a ratio of the built floor area over the entire lot area. So that's usually, it's a, it's a metric that um, planning boards and zoning um, ordinances use to kind of control um, how high and how densely you can build on a site. Does that help? Thank you, Michelle. Sure. So to recap, the CHA is looking to continue reinvestment in the city. Um, you know, the, the CHA was founded in 1935 and we have over 70 years of experience in North Cambridge. Our project team has over 100 collective years experience with affordable housing in Cambridge. This is the ideal location for housing. The project will replace 57 offline apartments. It's going to preserve 118 affordable apartments that are uh, at risk. And we're looking to add up to 120 additional affordable apartments in the amenity rich neighborhood of North Cambridge. Um, so we are looking to, um, uh, under zoning, we're looking to do this project under the affordable housing overlay. Uh, this allows for increased density to meet housing demand uh, with guidelines for, to ensure that the development fits within the neighborhood. Uh, it still has a robust um, review process um, and we're looking forward to working with the city on that process. Um, the design goals, we're looking to integrate the new development with uh, JP Fed and JP State, um, as well as the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, I think bringing, you know, if, with the uh, addition of the bicycle path or, or um, uh, mixed use path, I think that would be a great uh, connection uh, for, you know, people in the neighborhood moving through the site, as well as prov providing the much needed uh, Child care um, along Lynch Avenue. Um, so integrating the the neighborhood um, and both the scale, um, but also respecting um, the scale and size of the neighborhood. And lastly, and very importantly, the sustainability. The project is going to greatly increase the sustainability and resilience of Jefferson Park Federal and the North Cambridge neighborhood. Um, we are. Looking forward to increasing the, the sustainability of the buildings, um, and as Michelle alluded to, you know, reducing um, urban heat island effect um, through plantings, um, through um, using white roofs, um, and that sort of thing. So next steps, the next neighborhood meeting is going to be Thursday, March 25th at 6 p.m. Uh, we have a website up for our residents and the community to um, get information and provide us feedback. Um, you can visit www.coerb.co slash jpfed. Uh, you can sign up for uh, project updates. Um, as well as uh, leave your comments uh, and feedback for us on that website. So now we're going to take uh, comments and feedback, uh, any questions. So please, uh, if you haven't already, use the mm -hmm. chat function to, um, to ask any questions. Uh, after we go through the chats, uh, through the written questions, we are going to open it up for uh, verbal comments and questions. Uh, before I do that, 
Um, I would just like to introduce uh, Cassie Arnaud uh, from uh, the city staff uh, who has joined us as well. Thanks for joining us, Cassie. So, Joe, we got a, a handful of comments um, in the chat during the meeting. Let's start with those. Um, the first was uh, from Heather Hoffman, and she was asking um, about the multi-use path that you mentioned. Um, and so this uh, multi-use path is very, very preliminary. It was um, mentioned in chapter five of the city of Cambridge's bicycle plan in 2015. And I know the city has been exploring the idea of dating back to like the late uh, 1990s. And so really what the city is doing is asking that we don't build anything that would preclude the potential of this bike path in the future. Um, I hope that answers your question, Heather. We had another question uh, from James Williamson, a resident of CHA, um, who asked about the ratio of existing open space versus proposed. Um, we don't have that on hand tonight, James, but we will definitely have that for the next meeting. Um, and then we had another question from a resident um, at Jefferson Park, Anthony, who asked about the view to the cemetery. He said, are you going to block the view to the cemetery? Because there's a bunch of residents who don't particularly like that view. Um, Steve, I'm wondering, or Michelle, I'm wondering if you want to talk um, about how kind of the relationship between the site and the cemetery. Jill, do you want me to take that or would you like to? I'd take that. You're going to take it? Oh, I said you could take okay. it. Okay. Okay. Um, I actually, uh, we think that the cemetery is a really valuable asset to the um, JP Federal site in that it, it, it provides one of the few places in Cambridge where you have some, a nice kind of distant view across the cemetery. Um, and there's some beautiful trees along the property between the cemetery and our site, which we intend to maintain and keep. So we think... Um, the cemetery sort of acts like one of the lungs of the city. It provides air and light. And um, we've intentionally tried to have apartments face that way to take advantage of that view. So we, we, we see it as a very positive thing and um, as a great opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, we have another question from Ronnie Miller. Have, how much have you engaged with residents in JP to understand their needs and wishes? Joe, are you able to kind of talk through the engagement process? Sure. So, um, you know, we've actually been working with residents, working um, to kind of develop this plan um, for almost five years now. Um, you know, originally, uh, did not start as a complete redevelopment. Um, originally, it was um, kind of a, a smaller scale um, project uh, until we realized the, the scope and need um, and, you know, basically that we wouldn't be able to repair the existing buildings in place. Um, and so throughout this process, um, we've been um, having regular resident meetings. Um, you know, it's been kind of start and stop as, as you know, without funding, you know, the project hasn't, uh, you know, isn't, isn't really real yet. Um, and so now that we have funding and the project's moving, um, we're having, you know, um, almost weekly uh, meetings with residents, if, you know, at least a couple times a month. So we're meeting with residents to discuss the design plans. We met with residents um, to show, present all of this to them first. Um, before we uh, came out to the community. Um, and we are meeting with our residents to discuss um, you know, the relocation process, uh, the designs, um, and you know, we're, we're asking for their input on um, what we're presenting. Um, you know, next, next week, um, we're planning to have a resident meeting um, to discuss um, 
you know, our use of open space and, and landscaping. So um, the residents are, are definitely involved in the process. Thank you, Joe. Um, we have another question from Diane. Why wasn't there more significant outreach regarding this meeting? How do you plan to make sure residents on Rinjab and North Cambridge know about the next meeting? Um, so I wanna say that it's certainly not our intention to, to curb outreach for this meeting. We, we want um, people to attend these meetings. Uh, notices were mailed to uh, all the abutters within 300 feet of our site. Um, but moving forward, we can certainly uh, post uh, announcements for the next meeting on our website. Um, we can actually post the recording of this meeting. So anybody who wasn't able to meet tonight can have a recording. And then we can do some hand flyering, uh, you know, along Ringe that can both announce the next meeting and also let people know that a recording of, of this is available. So thank you. Thank you for that comment, Diane. Joe, we have another um, question here um, about trees. Um, I've heard that you will remove 200 mature trees as part of this development. Can you speak a bit about trees on site? Sure. So uh, there are approximately 200 trees on the development currently. Um, and you know, we are not gonna remove 200 trees. Um, we are working with our architects and landscape architects to uh, identify trees that we can keep and um, you know trying to um, you know kind of massage things a little bit to make sure that we can keep as many trees as possible um, we know that that trees and a healthy uh, tree canopy um, is important to uh, our residents, it's important to us, uh, it's important to the neighborhood. Um, so, you know, minimizing the amount of trees that we need to take down, um, we know that there will be a large number of trees that need to be taken down. Um, we have a, a survey that was conducted um, of every single tree. Um, I think there's about 206 of them. Um, a lot of the trees on site um, are not very healthy, um, just because of the kind of dense, uh, you know, kind of urban environment that they're in. Um, you know, a lot of them are weed trees or you know volunteer trees. Um, we are, you know, regardless of the species or, um, you know, unless it's a, a, a safety threat or a dead or dying tree. You know, we're looking to try to keep, um, you know, any trees that we can, um, and also, you know, committing to to planting more trees, to, you know, working on the design to to you know shade uh, asphalt to you know reduce the heat island effect, um, and we we understand that the trees are very important and. Um, I, you know, we're still identifying what the impact of, of these buildings will be. And I think we'll, we'll have hard numbers to be able to share with the community when we come back on the 25th. Um, um, but we're still working through that, um, both as far as, you know, how many trees would have to be removed, um, but also what we can do to replace them. Um, and, you know, I think it's important that we look at the landscaping plan, not just as, um, you know, kind of where we can add like ornamental trees, but how do we really look at this to you know, increase the, the canopy? Um, and what does the canopy look like, you know, five years, 10 years down the road? Um, that's something that we're, we're taking a real hard look at. Thanks, Joe. We have another question from Betsy Boyle. Um, what are the existing parking conditions compared to what's planned? There's a concern that JP residents will spill over into adjacent neighborhoods to park. And with all the new development in the area, we're losing a lot of parking spaces already in North Cambridge. So, 
So um, I think the, the current plan is to, um, I'm not sure if the, if the actual number of parking spots are being reduced, but the um, ratio of, of parking to units um, as allowed under the affordable housing underlay is um, 0.4 spots per unit. And I think that's uh, about what we're looking to target. Um, I think, you know, we've surveyed our residents and we know that absolutely a lot of them rely on, on cars um, and need parking, um, but the relationship to Alewife and the uh, access to public, the really unique access to public transportation that this site has, I think, uh, makes it a good candidate to reduce uh, some of the on-site parking. Thanks, Joe. Michelle and Steve, I'm wondering if you can also speak a bit about the balance um, between uh, parking on site, um, blue bikes and open space. How you've been approaching finding the right balance there. Or, um, so I think Joe's correct. We are aiming for it to meet the 0.4% um, parking to unit count uh, requirement of the, of the affordable housing overlay. Um, but more importantly, we're also really trying to improve um, bike infrastructure throughout the development, uh, both with the multi-use path and just providing really clear uh, circulation on the site, providing long-term secure bike parking on the site um, for residents, providing short-term parking for people who might be visiting. And um, again, it's it's one of the sort of series of trade-offs and, and calculations and kind of negotiations that we make over the course of the design to kind of understand what is the impact of um, parking versus green space versus um, um, you know, bike infrastructure to kind of arrive at the right mix um, to create a really high quality of life for the residents. Thanks, Michelle. One other question on the open space is, um, if one of the goal is to maintain and increase security, it seems like having a number of courtyards could perhaps decrease it. The new JP state was built so that there are very extended sight lines keeping it open and reducing oppor opportunity for higher risk activity. Can you speak about um, the courtyards at JP? Sure. Um, I think one of the sort of quality, well, one of the goals of the design is to kind of, as we mentioned, create various um, sizes and characters of, of open space. So those courtyards are relatively enclosed. They're still, they're not completely enclosed in terms of completely private, but they are, um, they are sort of the realm of that building. So the, the residents who live in those buildings have floor through apartments. They will be able to look out their front window onto the street and look out their back window onto the courtyard. So it's really sort of almost own space um, for those residents in those buildings. So it's, it's kind of relying on the community to kind of help um, create the sight lines and um, keep eyes on public spaces and uh, create a sense of security in that way. Is that helpful? Thanks, Michelle. Um, I think the next question is for you as well. Um, it's from a direct abutter across of Ringe Ave and says, you know, while I appreciate um, that the, the JP, that this revitalization will bring, I'm concerned about my house now facing solid walls of higher buildings, as opposed to the two lower ones that are there now. It seems like a lot of light will be blocked. And also I have solar on my roof. It will need to make sure that the higher height of the building doesn't affect solar generation. Can you talk about kind of the scale along range? Sure. Um, I, I want to assure this resident that we will be studying um, kind of uh, solar insulation along the site and we will be um, 
as part of our submission, part of our permitting process, we will be studying um, specifically any neighboring solar arrays so we will make sure that our building doesn't impact um, solar availability for your installation. Um, and I think we will look also at, at the scale of the building um, facing the neighborhood and if there are any opportunities to kind of massage that and step back or uh, just kind of address the scale across range, we will do so. Um, if, if we could just, Michelle, maybe say how tall the building along Range Avenue is? Currently it's uh, 45 feet. Actually, I think it's 43 feet. Thanks. Give me a second to find the next question. So we have one concern um, about listing public transit as an amenity, um, but that it in fact can be very difficult to use uh, and not run all of the time. So I wanted to note that that's not really a question, but it's, um, but it's a comment. And then another comment about sounds like a shadow study is needed for range neighborhoods, especially for winter mornings. So thank you very much for that comment. We'll definitely come back with the next at the next neighborhood meeting with um, more more details on the design. All right, let's open it up. Oh no, sorry, I missed one. Um, I'm curious if CHA feels its new former stateside JP meets the neighborhood feel you're going for. Um, it did not feel that way to me when I walked through it. Um, so Joe, can you maybe just speak a little bit, um, and Margaret, if you wanna jump in about kind of the successes that we see of JP State and what we hear from our residents. Sure, I mean, I think, um, you know, I mean, you can see uh, in that photo at the, at the, at the bottom of the slide, the new JP State, um, you know, apartments have, have their own um, patios, um, they have their own entrances, um, you know, you're not, you're not entering from, from one uh, central uh, location. Um, so that kind of gives ownership of, of these spaces to, to the individual residents. Um, I think, you know, it's the the different variations in massing, the the varying uh, scale of the buildings from the three stories to four stories, um, and then the little you know one story uh, balconies. I mean, I think it you know is is definitely trying to get at that that neighborhood feel, um, and that's something that we're going to be looking at closely um, as the design progresses for uh, this new development. Um, you know, I think um, we can we can take a better look at uh, you know some of the landscaping. Um, I think you know I think we've, we've had a comment that you know maybe it feels too urban, um, but uh, you know these are all these are all uh, concerns that we're we're looking at. But uh, overall, I think you know JP um, there are really some beautiful buildings and. Um, you know, it has it has a, a scale of you know a, a family scale to it that I think our residents appreciate. Thanks, Joe. And then just before we open it up for comment, there's been uh, two more comments that have come in. Um, so one is just emphasizing um, how important uh, the tree canopy is, especially a mature one, um, and so. Um, we're saving all of these comments and we will certainly come back at next meeting uh, with a tree inventory um, as, as part of the, the next neighborhood design meeting. Um, there's also a comment about 
uh, looking into the impacts of flooding and what we're doing to mitigate floods, given the fact that this isn't a flood zone. So um, we've taken note of that and we absolutely will come back at the next meeting. Um, so at that- I um, think, oh, sorry, Claire, I was just yeah. quickly, um, you know, we're, we are looking as far as flooding mitigation, we are looking at um, eliminating um, basements. Um, we are looking at uh, moving mechanical spaces uh, to rooftops uh, down on the first floors of buildings to you know, make the site much more resilient. Um, I think um, you know, uh, as the design develops, we can look at uh, you know, anything that we're doing along that, that back uh, corridor that's at risk for that um, um, point, uh, 0.02 or 0.2 percent flooding risk. Um, but it is something we already we already looking at. So. Thanks, Joe. Um, okay, so let's open it up um, for, for verbal comment. Please feel free to keep um, comments or questions coming through the chat because uh, we can continue to take those as well. Um, but James, you have your hand raised. Um, let me ask you to unmute yourself. And again, we just remind people that we ask you to keep uh, your questions and comments to three minutes. Thank you. Okay, hi, right, thanks. So first of all, um, I think if this is a community meeting, I think it would be a richer community meeting if, if the format were more open so that we could all see each other's comments and questions. Um, and I'd recommend that, suggest that uh, either for the rest of this meeting or certainly for future meetings. Secondly, I do get a little irritated with what I think is an unfair exaggeration of how wonderful public transit is and is going to be for the current and, and additional residents, however many there are. I take it every day. It's really awful. The 83 bus, which is the one bus that serves this area, nearly tips over. I've been trying to get it fixed for 10 years when it leaves the berth uh, at Offer and Jav. The red line, then they're cutting service now. The red line is a, is, 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 is a horrific experience uh, now and has been for the last 10 months. It wasn't great before then. So I just wish you would, I mean, and I'm afraid that some of the people who make these statements are people who don't take public transit. So I, I wish you just at least stop exaggerating it. And also the so-called amenities. Pharaoh's Food Town is wonderful. But if you have to walk across that bridge to get over to the Fresh Pond Mall, it's really not a great experience. So I just ask you not to, not to overstate some of this. Specifically, my biggest concern is with the site plan is the intention to move Jackson Place over to adjacent to the cemetery. And there are several different constituencies that this will negatively affect. It'll negative, have a negative impact on the cemetery. Visitors to the cemetery, um, people go attending funerals at the cemetery to have a driveway next to the cemetery is not gonna be great for them. There isn't one on the other side. It's also not gonna be great for people who live in, if all the buildings do get taken down and there are new buildings, it would really be great to have the relationship that currently exists where when I look out my back window, there's a maybe 15, 20 foot buffer, a little green space, and then the open green space of the cemetery. That will be eliminated and replaced with a driveway and parked cars. That's not great. It's not just about the view, it's about that relationship. Also, um, if you move the street over, you're breaking the existing connection to the neighborhood from Jackson Place across the street to Jackson Street, but you continue to say that you're improving connectivity to the neighborhood. I just, that just strikes me as, I'm sorry, it's, it's disingenuous. It's actually disrupting the existing connectivity and also maybe getting rid of the dry cleaners at the corner. Um, so I think if you preserve that if you, if you had Jackson Place continue in a, something similar to where it is now, you could have new buildings, if you want to do new buildings, that maintained those relationships, didn't disrupt them, and you could work on a site plan that accommodates many of your goals, but doesn't disturb the, uh, these important relationships. And finally, I just think adding another, as many as 120 additional units is not great for the people who currently live here and will live here in the future. I thought there was an idea that we were trying to avoid concentrations of poverty. You're going up, if you went up to 200, James, okay, maybe. I'm gonna, that's three okay. minutes. So I'll just let you finish your thought, I think please. there's some real concerns here that can still need to be fleshed out. Thank you. All right, thank you for that, James. Um, 
So I, you know, just personally, um, in the before times, I took the red line from JP State into Cambridge uh, every day. Um, and, you know, I, it, it worked for me, but I know everyone's experience with that is not going to be the same. Um, but I wanted to uh, maybe toss it to Steve, if you could uh, speak a little bit about the, um, the proposed site design. Sure. Um, can we run back, go back just to the presentation to the site? Uh, you know, I think, um, I think James raises a very interesting and good point about the connection to Jackson Street. Um, we would have liked to continue the uh, Jackson Street into the site, but there, uh, exist, there is an existing road uh, a, adjacent to um, the JP State side. It's where, where our new main Central Avenue is going in. That is existing and that, that has to stay. That was a condition of the JP State permit that that area be there. So if we had extended the Jackson Street into our site, you can see instead of having a city block that approximates what is currently there, as you can see on this side of Ringe Avenue, you would have had two very tiny, tiny slivers of land, which are undevelopable. Um, and further, uh, we would have then had the, we would probably had a single row of buildings along Jackson Street with the backs facing into the cemetery. And that's what's there now. And, and we have already demonstrated, we know that it does not work. So what, what was, what's being suggested has already been tried and does not work. So we don't want to repeat the same mistake over again. Uh, so that, you know, as much as we would have liked to, and I, I promise you, I assure you, we looked at extending Jackson Street. It just isn't, we have to work with the site we have. We have a site we have these existing constraints, dimensional and otherwise. And so we cannot get everything to be perfect. So there are compromises that have to be made. That was a compromise we thought was well worth it in order to accomplish some other goals, like having proper city blocks, being able to have sort of good front back relationships, much like the neighbors on the other side of Ringe have, they have a front yard, a front door, and they have a backyard. And that's what we've tried to accomplish here. Um, so I, I think I'll leave it at that in the interest of allowing more time for discussion. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Steve. So let's uh, next go to Mike Nakagawa. We'll ask you to unmute yourself. Hello. Hey, Hello. Mike, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay. Sorry, my camera is not working. Um, I do want to point out in the site, we, you talked about how good the state plan looks, but if you're looking at trees, they're really hard to find from this view, which you can see in the lower left corner. Um, but they're very obvious where the trees shade the buildings on currently in the federal side. And um, on the plans that were shown on 3D, the, you had trees being shaded by the new buildings trying to accommodate the additional um, housing that you're putting on the site, I presume. Um, and, and trees are really important for multiple reasons, including the mental health of people. It's just calming to have trees there and it's cooling when you can be out, walk outside and be cooled by the trees in the summer as we approach the heat that's coming. I'm a part of the Climate Resilience Zoning Task Force and I've been on the city's climate change preparedness and resiliency planning and, um, and the outcomes of the, uh, the urban forest um, master plan process are, are saying we need to improve our tree canopy and we have mature trees here, like really big trees. About 90% are greater than eight inch diameter, which is, is the threshold for the tree protection ordinance, and over half or over 12 inches. And, um, and they, they provide air filtering. This is a really, um, there's a lot of traffic that goes by that filters the air that you have the cooling benefits. Um, so what I, I appreciated in the Miller's River project 
was an active um, looking at the mature trees and trying to save them as many as possible. I'm concerned looking at the, the uh, Jefferson Park state side of how they eliminated almost everything to go with a clean slate and only had a few remaining trees afterwards. So that's part of the concern is you can say, well, save as many as possible. They saved, I think, five trees on the state side. And we're talking about environmental justice issues um, with Jerry's Pond across the street because um, of the Fresh Pond Apartments and 402 Ringe and how that's a wasteland. When I was dropping my kids' friends off after high school activities, I'd go through Jefferson Park and it, it was like a park. There were big trees and it was nice when I dropped the kids off there and I continue on to um, 402 Ringe and it was desolate with just a desert without any much in the way of trees. And we're creating something similar here, removing mature trees, adding more people with tall buildings. And I don't see the state side as being a model to continue with. The other thing I'd like to say is I'd like to see connectivity to Dandahi Park as part of this, because we need a way to get to the other side of the tracks that's safe without going over the big bridge and people um, are having a hard time doing it. If you added that connection that people could from all along the affordable housing projects and the multi-use path and get to Danahee Park and by biking that makes it safe for high school uh, cyclists to get to school, getting underneath instead of going down Ringe and then Sherman where I've been hit by a car biking on Sherman. You could avoid that by going Garden Street across uh, Danahee Park and this is the time to be planning that sort of connectivity of not having to go over but under. And I didn't used to agree to this because it has a high water table, but we can make tunnels, we can do something, and maybe it's prone to flooding every once in a while. But for the most part, it would make a lot of access to a lot of people to get to Danny Park and the shopping center if it's right behind the, um, um, the, the movie theater there. So those are kind of my my main points there but i just found it hard to find to get to this meeting like i looked on your site i had to look at one of the newsletters to find in there that there was a meeting being held and then you don't mention it's a zoom meeting you just have here's the passcode and and the meeting id not mentioning it's zoom i wonder how many people couldn't find it when i sent out a thing to let people know about it they didn't understand what that meant and and i only found out about it because of james was mentioning it otherwise i would have had no idea if this meeting was occurring and no idea how to find that so yeah, thank you mike you're doing a good job with your outreach there thank you well yeah and as you know claire mentioned i think you know we can definitely look at at improving that um you know, we definitely take those comments to heart and you know definitely want to to increase the, the visibility of this and that outreach so it's something that we're going to work on um and thank you for you know your comments on the trees uh, i think this is something that we're you know, really looking at closely and we're going to have a lot more information um for everyone at the next meeting um and you know, I think, um, you know, we can, we can do, um, you know, looking at JP State, I think, you know, there's definitely things that we can improve on and um, looking at, uh, you know, both existing tree canopy and, and kind of future tree canopy is, is something that we can definitely work on, but we'll have more information on that uh, at the next meeting. Thanks, Joe. Um, so I wanted to just read another comment that's come in um, from the chat um, from Natalie Ribeiro saying um, that families generally need cars to transport kids and shopping and groceries. Uh, so thank you for that comment, Natalie. We've taken note of that. Um, we also had a question um, about the impact of the affordable housing overlay um, So uh, on JP. So, um, I'd like to know if you figured out how many units you would have been able to add to the site if the project had proceeded before the affordable housing overlay took effect, and how much of a bonus does the city get here from the affordable housing overlay? Um, 
So without the affordable housing overlay under the base zoning, um, it's a residence B district, uh, there's an FAR of 0.5 on site. Um, and me, Clara. That, oh yeah? Clara, I'm sorry, this is Steve Baker. I, I just gave this number to Clara and that, that number is inaccurate. It's actually okay. 100. It's 140. I didn't want you telling everybody. Sorry to interrupt. But no know. worries, Steve. Thank you. I appreciate that. My mistake. My mistake. <laughs> um, so 140 units then would have been the base zoning. Uh, thanks, Steve. And now we're looking um, at up to um, 295. So a significant increase um, that the city gains due to the affordable housing overlay. Somebody else asked a question, how did you choose FAR? Um, so the FAR is determined uh, by height limits and also open space requirements. Uh, so we did not have a specific target for FAR at this site, um, but we needed to work within the setback requirements, the distance that's allowed from the site perimeter, um, the height restrictions that are allowed under the affordable housing overlay that limits us to four stories, and then also making sure that there's at least 30% of open space. So that's how the FAR was determined. Um, all right, let's go back to verbal comments. Looks like we have one from Daniel E. Hi, hey, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, an observation uh, I would like to share. Uh, residents are, as you know, um, elderly and often they do not have uh, internet connections and do not have comfort level with the internet technology, such as Zoom. Yet it seems that the internet is the primary form of outreach for direct resident participation. And I'd like you to address why you chose uh, the internet technology as really the primary reason uh, or, or method rather of outreach. And I have a second observation as well. Okay, you can want to go ahead with your, your second observation. Uh, well, I'm actually quite dismayed. Uh, Mr. Bendar, you mentioned a funding pathway as a reason uh, for moving forward at this time. I'm dismayed that um, in this particular context in which all of us live uh, is not fully considered. Specifically, the fact that COVID-19 is an obvious concern for residents. And the proposal for moving forward with relocation at this time in a pandemic presents obvious concerns about safety. And I'm sure you agree, obviously the primary concern for, for residents at this time is the health of their families and survival. And you mm -hmm. cite the demographics on your website for residents of Jefferson Park, and you must acknowledge that the COVID-19 is higher in the African American community and minority as well. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so uh, first, with your, your first point, um, you know, given the, the you know, health crisis that we're in, we can't be hosting um, in-person meetings, which is what we would typically been doing. Um, so, you know, to, we, you know, absolutely acknowledge that not all of our residents can participate in Zoom, not all of the residents are familiar or have uh, access to, um, you know, the internet. Um, they all can, you know, there is the ability for residents to call in um, and, you know, we're working with them to, you know, help more and more residents um, just you know, use their phones to participate. Um, but we're also you know, sending out a newsletter summarizing every meeting. Um, we're uh, trying to post materials uh, on the site for residents that can't uh, see, you know, like the site plan uh, is gonna get posted um, on the site for residents to see. Um, and then, you know, most importantly, um, you know, myself and my colleagues are 
uh, available by phone um, for residents to contact if they have any questions. And you know, I think that's you know, we're 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 aware that it's you know not a, a perfect process. Um, and you know, as far as you know, relocation, you know, during COVID, uh, the CHA has has been relocating families at its other sites. Um, we've developed an entire protocol for safety and, um, you know, the health of our residents, um, and we've been able to do it successfully. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, things will be better. Uh, we're looking forward to you know, improved conditions, not just for this project, but just for everyone. Um, and you know, I think it's a, You know, we're we're looking forward to you know continuing to to work you know with our residents and like I said it's it's um, what uh, we're we're reaching out in as many ways as we can. Um, uh, I'm sorry. What was the second question um, was about proceeding with relocation during a pandemic. Um, I'm sorry. That's together. okay. Um, so, Daniel, I mean, this is a very, very serious concern of the Cambridge Housing Authorities. And um, we stopped relocation for a number of months because um, they're at our other sites that are um, we're getting prepared for revitalization work and construction or we're um, in. Uh, an ongoing construction site um, because we did not have the protocols um, or the existing protocols for relocation had way too much intermingling between movers mm -hmm. and residents and we did not feel safe moving forward with relocation. And so we stalled relocation for months. We met with our uh, moving teams um, and with all of our staff, staff teams and we remade our relocation protocols for COVID so that there is a separation between, um, between residents and movers um, so that we were comfortable and residents were comfortable that they could proceed with relocation safely. Um, it is absolutely something we do not take lightly and we would not have proceeded uh, with relocation were we not comfortable um, and were our residents not comfortable with relocation and the new protocols that we had. Um, and so we will, certainly be bringing um, the updated relocation protocols to our relocation meetings with residents um, later this month and can answer any more questions then. But we absolutely, um, absolutely hear that concern and have worked very hard, um, our relocation coordinators have and the moving companies have to ensure um, safety, health and safety protocols are, are you know, are, um, upheld to protect residents and movers and staff and our community. Margaret, is there anything else um, you wanted to mention on that point? I know you spent a lot of time working with um, the moving companies and on our real and on our COVID safety plan. Yeah, I mean it was a, a really deep concern of us, you know, when we um, stopped it uh, when the pandemic first started, and I think we worked really hard um, to develop with a, a, a firm very experienced in um, industrial hygiene and and um, um, mitigation and and we put them in place and they have worked really well for us and I and for our residents and um, I've been really pleased that that uh, with the overall effectiveness of it um, but it's something that we continue to review and monitor and adjust as, as needed but um, to date it's um, it's gone very very well and you know I've been um, I think our residents have really appreciated the the focus that we we gave it initially and the continuing focus that we um, do on a daily basis uh, in terms of, of, of relocation activity and and it's gone you know as we, we started it back now going back to August of last year it's it's gone exceedingly well um, and I think the, the individual residents um, the work that we do individually with our residents, with our relocation coordinators and with the movers has been a real key element to its overall success as well. Thanks, Margaret. Um, 
So there's also been some questions in the chat regarding the dry cleaners, Regazio dry cleaners, and whether the CHA has reached out to the owner of the dry cleaner. Um, so CHA has reached out to the owner who owns the dry cleaning space, as well as to the business owner who currently operates the space. Um, and we will be meeting with them separately to review the design and their options for relocation as the design progresses in more detail. We also have um, another question in the chat about um, why did you find it necessary to create so much more roadway, which necessarily increases the amount of impervious surface on site? Are these roads necessary for any reasons um, other than the state of dislike for the cul-de-sac? Um, I think you know, Steve can probably speak more to this, but I think, you know, some of our priorities of, um, you know, integrating with uh, the surrounding neighborhoods, um, um, I think most importantly, giving as many households front doors as possible. Um, I think that's really important um, to kind of put eyes on the street, give people a feeling of ownership over that space. Um, but uh, Steve or Michelle, would either of you like to speak a little more on that? Let me take this one. Uh, so several things. I think Joe hit probably the single most important thing was to try and have as many private front entrances as possible. Um, that requires street frontage. We also wanted, as we mentioned at the outset, to uh, mimic this essentially or extend the same typology as exists in the neighborhood with the street grid. So as, as Michelle noted earlier, we have a block size that approximates what's there. So I, I don't necessarily agree that there's a lot more asphalt. It, it's sort of what's on the other side of Ringe Avenue. It's a similar scale. And um, we think that that, though, that street grid provides more opportunity for interaction with the residents. It also provides places for people to park. Um, you know, people park on street and, and without it, we would have had to have parking lots and parking lots have their own problems, especially with regard to issues like Heat Island. So I, I don't know that um, we really have more asphalt than we otherwise would have had. It's just uh, in a different way, it's put it in a different way. Thanks, Joe. Steve. Great. So that wraps up um, the questions that we have in the chat and the comments. Um, just let's give folks another 30 seconds or so to raise your hand if, um, if you've been waiting to. Um, I do, while we kind of give people that opportunity, I, I do want to reiterate um, that we really, really appreciate the feedback on the, the fact that this meeting was hard to find. That really was not our intention at all. And so we have recorded this meeting. We will post a link to the recording on um, JP's site-specific website, also on the JP page on our CHA website. Um, and we will post the next meeting there as well. Joe, if you go back one slide, just so folks can write it down. Um, next neighborhood meeting is Thursday, March 25th at 6 p.m. Um, and here's a link to the to the project website. Uh, we will also do some flyering of uh, abutters on Ringe Ave. So um, thank you very much for that feedback and we will certainly do a better job for the next meeting. Um, all right, there, I do see um, James, your hand is raised again, but um, in the interest of time, um, and you've already asked some questions in the chat and uh, and given verbal comment for three minutes, um, I just ask you to give uh, Joe a call tomorrow um, and he can take your questions. Joe, back to you. All right. I just wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight, uh, especially all of you who provided us a comment and, and feedback. Um, we, we really appreciate that and we, um, you know, we take it all very seriously, um, but we are really excited to you know, continue this process with the neighborhood, with our residents uh, and keep 
um, progressing with this design. Um, so thank you all for attending tonight um, and we look forward to seeing you on the 25th. Um, thank you and have a good night.